Hello, this is Michael Pilarski uh, from the Global Earth Repair Foundation with the, another of our video series on earth repair. And today's topic is retaining water in the landscape. And that also means erosion control. And we're going to look at a whole series of techniques from the least intensive uh, to the most intensive. So things that take uh, not too much work per acre to accomplish to things that uh, are very time, you know, time consuming, resource, power intensive. So here we go. But first, let's set the context. The world right now, and has been for millennia actually, but the numbers of floods and droughts in the world have been going up over historic time. And that's because we've been destroying more and more of the world's ecosystems or degrading them, damaging them. And so we're on a downhill slope and we need to turn things around. When it comes to floods, recently there's been massive floods in China, which has really hurt their crop production. This year, there has been a lot of flooding in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, in Yemen, Iran, Saudi Arabia. You can go online and see pictures of just raging torrents of water rushing off the landscape and lots of soil with it. Um, there is a lot of flooding in the U.S. Midwest this year and last year was really record. California has been having a lots of series of droughts, but they also have heavy rainfall periods, in which case they have floods, so alternating floods and droughts. Now, folks, what I'm about to tell you today is how to fix all of these problems. The problems for fixing floods are the same, are the same solutions that fix droughts. So in a sense, we could say we're drought-proofing and flood-proofing the landscape. That's a big statement to make. Um, but we'll see that we can actually do quite a bit to reduce floods and droughts in the world, and uh, that will be a good thing. So, starting from the least intensive. Improving grazing practices, or in some cases, stopping livestock grazing on pieces of land. A lot of the degradation of the, of the world has been done with livestock in proper management. Nearly half of the lower 48 states of the United States is used for grazing, and approximately 45 to 50 percent of the whole world's land surface is being grazed by livestock at this time. That's a really big proportion of the landscape. If we could improve the livestock grazing practices, we would greatly improve the situation. And uh, there's a lot of information on improved grazing systems, and I won't go into those at this time. And then the next step up is seeding, getting more plant cover on the landscape. Plants reduce water runoff. They increase water uh, retention and uh, infiltration into the ground. So the simplest way is to do broad scale broadcasting of seeds. There's a lot of ways to do this. One way is uh, starting it from the most uh, intense, uh, the most extensive is actually broadcast seeding from helicopters and airplanes. You can do pretty large areas pretty quickly using that method. Most of the seeding uh, is done by things like cyclone seeders. They're a hand crank seeder that that spreads seeds over maybe a 12, 15 foot. Uh, path in front of you so you can walk over maybe 10 acres a day spreading seeds. Then there's also something called range land drills and those are heavy duty uh, grain drill modifications that can drive over range land and relatively rough land. They have to be able to be pulled by a tractor. There has to be soil. They can't, you know, it's not rocky mountainous landscape but this is where you have um, some kind of soil and you can get on there with a tractor or a bulldozer pulling a rangeland drill. And that sets the seed in. Oh, you can set the depth, or half, quarter inch, half inch, inch deep uh, for getting the seeds in the ground. And that gets them out of the level of um, predation of animals. Now, when you do um, broadcast seeding, in some instances, and in fact, we might even say in many instances, rodents and or birds will take a lot of the seed and it will be for naught or you'll get a small germination rate because so many are eaten. So a really good way to fix that is to do seed pelletizing. 
There are uh, several different ways to do seed pelletizing. It's basically coating them usually in clay and um, you can include when you're making that coating, you can include things like mycorrhizal inoculants, fungal inoculants, bacterial inoculants. You can put in various small bits of minerals. You can put in a bit of kelp, um, micronutrients. So you can put in things that will help them germinate. You can also uh, add things like cayenne pepper, neem seed oil or castor oil, things that will actually deter birds and rodents from even wanting to eat them. So this will greatly enhance uh, germination or success when you're doing broad scale seeding. Uh, Masanobu Fukuoka uh, of Natural Way of Farming in Japan developed several different methods of, of pelletizing, hand, pretty much one's by hand using screens and one is by using cement mixers, a simple cement mixer. There's also high-tech uh, machines at large scale uh, in the United States and other places where they do seed pelletizing. So there's simple and then there's more complex ways to do that. In Australia, they developed a series of tree seed seeding machines. In other words, they have a machine you can pull again with a tractor or a little bulldozer or something that trail goes across the landscape putting out putting in tree seeds. Usually when you think of rangeland drills, you think you're planting grain or grasses or forbs, you know, herbs. But uh, in Australia, they developed a whole series of machines that put in tree seeds. And so they can cover 50 acres, maybe even 100 acres a day with these tree seeding machines and plant a whole forest really quickly uh, if conditions are just right. Another thing about putting plants in the landscape for water retention is putting hedgerows, windbreaks, and grass strips in the landscape, generally on contour or across slope. And these all then will hold up water too. Vetiver uh, grass plantations on hillsides is used a lot in Asia and in other parts of the world as one example. Another way to do it again is with roughening the landscape. If you if you roughen the landscape so that or the terrain you might say the soil surface then it uh, will it, it doesn't things just can't flow as fast it's held up by the various roughening. Now this is sometimes done with pitting. It's called pitting. And I first learned about pitting uh, from Bill Mollison when he talked about they, in Australia, they have a lot of outback airports, way in the outback, where they have a lot of dust storms. And you can't land the airplanes in a heavy dust storm. So they found that if they pitted the soil surface for hundreds of acres around the airport, it reduced the dust storms. It reduced the, uh, the velocity of the wind around the airport. So the, the pitting helps reduce wind velocity and dust storms. And a person who really made history with pitting is uh, a man named Yakuba Sabadago. Now this is hand pitting landscapes. Uh, Yakuba is from Burkina Faso in the Sahel of uh, Africa. And they have you know, a lot of erosion, a lot of uh, problems with uh, droughts in the Sahel. And so he would dig these holes. They're about, oh, th maybe two to three feet diameter with a, a hand hoe. And they're maybe, oh, uh, a foot deep. So there, there's a series. And then he'll mail, build a series of these or dig a series of these pits across the landscape on his farm. And the, when the water, when the rain did fall, it would f soak into the pits. It would run, it would, as it would try to run off, it would run into a pit, sink into the ground. He also would add manures and mulches to the, uh, to the uh, pits, and you could also add, and of course, add seeds. That became the cropping pattern, is to grow things in the pits. Now, in his case, he was so successful at increasing his water retention and getting better crop yields that the farmers around him, who at first ridiculed him for all the hard work, said, wow, that really is worth doing. And so they started doing it and it had spread farmer to farmer to thousands, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers in the Sahel on millions of acres of land, millions of hectares. So it's been very successful and, and getting a lot of uptake by just the peasantry. It didn't need government funding, they just did it themselves. So that is a form of pitting. 
traditional agriculture is always is in many places as used pitting the sunni the sunnis had a, a form of waffle gardening there are um, if, if we look through history we would find lots of examples of pitting ground to retain runoff to increase uh, crop yields in dry areas with rain-fed agriculture you can also do uh, in, uh, pitting with machines, of course. They can be do it with cut-off discs. They're called cut-out discs. And also, there is a man named Dr. Bob Dixon who invented a soil imprinter, which is a pitting machine, a type of pitting machine, in, um, in the U.S. Southwest. And he had a lot of good luck with that. So Dr. Dr. Bob Dixon, Soil Imprinting Foundation, another example. Another technique. Contour lines of, of material on the landscape, and this is, can be done, uh, they do this a lot in Africa. Uh, again, drought stricken, uh, drought areas of Sahel. They would make lines of rocks across contour on the landscape, relatively level ground uh, and, and on various levels of sloping ground. The rocks hold up the water temporarily, tend to drop out silt, and um, if you have a whole series of rock lines down the, uh, down the slope, you get a lot more water infiltration. You can also do that with pebbles. There are places where the, uh, pebble deserts where they actually side broadcast the pebbles into lines. You can also do it with organic matter. You can do it with mulch. You can just make soil, grad, you know, just for it's a, sort of a temporary uh, band of soil across the landscape. You can use branches <clears throat> where you have material. You can also use tree trunks laid across the landscape. This in forested landscapes, uh, this is uh, very commonly done or could more commonly be done after a forest fire where you have a lot of burned trunks, a lot of downed timber and you can lay it across slope because after a forest fire, generally there's going to be accelerated erosion. In Australia, they developed a system of a giant spirals of soil banks made by graders or bulldozers. And these cover like 10, 20, 50, 100 acres. They're very large scale systems. And they would, do, this is pretty flat land, but it's always got some slope. And they would drive in a big spiral pattern uh, and create a bank of oh, one foot, two foot soil. And whenever there's a big rain event, the, ro the water flows down and gets caught in the parts of the spiral, the big, uh, the ovals, you might say, or the crescent moon. Uh, you have a series of crescent moons facing up slope. And so they fill with water temporarily and then sink into the landscape. There's also a system called net and pan for tree planting. Net and pan means that you, on a sloping piece of ground, you either put up a berm um, or, or a trench going up slope, leading into a tree planting spot. And then below that, there's another uh, small pan, as it were, uh, or, or drainage area that feeds the next tree down. So the whole, the whole slope is, is crisscrossed by these systems that direct water to the planting spots, little basins where the trees are, or shrubs are. Okay, um, the next system or technique, and this is a big one, and this is called the Key Line system, uh, system of Water and Soil Management. It was developed by an Australian named P.A. Yeoman back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, well, maybe 50s and 60s especially, uh, and Mr. Yeoman wrote quite a few uh, books. Water for Every Farm is one of his uh, biggest one. I used to sell these books by the case. I ordered cases of these books from Australia and sold them here uh, in the United States. So Water for Every Farm, P.A. Yeoman's The Key Line System of Soil and Water Management. He developed a agricultural implement that was a subsoiler which you know which is a subsoil plow so to speak that is drawn through the soil and and makes rips in the soil so these um, special aerodynamically designed shanks that went into the soil have uh, special attachments at the tip called uh, either wombats after a famous digging animal in Australia or bat's wings and they're very wide and undercut the soil. So both of these actually help, you might say, lift the whole soil block that the plow is being run through. 
from the tip of the plow all the way to the surface. So this shatters the soil block or, and aerates it. So there are a huge amount more air spaces are created in the soil. Those can fill up with water in the next rainstorm. And so the water holding and air holding capacity, uh, capacity of the soil is greatly increased. This plow is, runs with only one third, you know, maybe half uh, or two thirds of the horsepower that other subsoilers need to go pull through the soil. And these can go four inches, six inches, eight, ten, all the way to up to 24 inches deep. Usually you start out uh, and, and do a series of these subsoilings over a course of three, four years, gradually deepening the topsoil as you go. And P.A. Yeomans claimed that you could start with a four inch topsoil and increase it to an eight inch topsoil in four years. You could take an eight inch topsoil and increase it to 16 inches. So you can greatly increase the depth of your topsoil, which is going to really increase crop yields. Water as it's flowing down the slope falls into these rips because they're usually at about three foot spacing uh, or even closer. And any water that's flowing across the surface falls into one of these rips. It just goes and sinks into the soil profile. So this stops soil erosion in its tracks. This would be a, just a fantastic system for all the grain growing regions of the world where there's slope on the farm fields, uh, places like the Palouse Hills in eastern Washington, uh, so many places. If you can get a tractor on the ground, then subsoil, and you're using cultivated agriculture, then subsoilers, these key line subsoilers really do a great job. These lines of, of subsoiling are done at slightly off contour, so it drifts the water from valleys and areas that water accumulates off to dry ridges, so it evens out the amount of water in the landscape. If there's so much water that the, that the whole soil profile is full and can't absorb any more moisture, he also has a series of diversion channels in the landscape as part of his system. And that, that's not in all systems that use key line, but it's one of the things you can do. And let me come back to diversion channels in a few minutes uh, when I, after I talk about swales. So, oh, by the way, these key line plows developed by P.A. Yeoman aren't just sort of a quirky invention by somebody far away that never got into production. These are sold by the thousands in Australia. It's one of the most popular plows. They, they, they use them in very large scale agriculture. They replace the moldboard plow in a lot of cases because they do not invert the soil profile. They keep the soil profile in place, topsoil on top and the subsoil down below. So it's a great system. Now, the next system I'll talk about is the system of swales. Swales is where you have sloping ground and you're going to get runoff when you have high rainfall events or sometimes even slow rain rainfall events. Whenever you have overland flow on a slope, you can put a series of swales in the landscape. A swale is a ditch on contour. And uh, it's on contour because it's going to create a long linear pond in the landscape. They can be uh, quite deep and wide, or they can be um, smaller. The, the greater the amount of water, generally the larger the swale that you're trying to capture. And they have to be situated every so often on down the slope. You don't just build one swale, generally. Generally, it's a whole series of swales on contour going down a slope so that all the water that falls and runs off from a particular, from a, a, a uh, length of slope is going to fa fall into a swale. And then below that swale, there's another length of slope and then another swale to collect that and so on. So you have to size the swales to the slope, the soil type, and the intensity of rainfall that you get in that location. So swales have to be very carefully designed because they're going to hold a lot of water. And so they have to be really on contour. You have to use uh, a, a really good system to build these on contour. Now, if the swale becomes full or a series of swales all become full in a high rainfall event, there has to be a safe way for the water to escape. It's the swale escape valve, and that is as at usually at the end, one end of the swale, 
there'll be a, a uh, area that where the bank is not quite as high so that the water will spill over that spillway. It's usually rock lined uh, or grassed in some way so that the, the water won't erode away that, that lip. And then the water has to be led safely down, you know, off the slope. And that is usually into a natural waterway or into a diversion channel or into a rocked waterway. In some way, you have to put it somewhere where it's not going to do damage on, as it leaves. So you don't want these swales to blow out. In other words, have a break somewhere and then it could flood down and take out the whole series of swales. So you need to design your swale spillway safe outlets. The, the, um, one of the places you could spill the water to would be a, a grassed waterway as another example. The swales can be built by hand, small swales. They can be built by draft animals with single bottom plows. That could be some horses or oxen. And it uh, can be done with side cast bulldozers or even with excavators. That's for the large scale ones where you have machinery. Back to diversion channels. So a swale is exactly on contour. A ditch exactly on contour. It holds the water. A diversion channel is a ditch slightly off contour. Maybe it falls like one or two feet in 100 feet. And it gently takes the water and directs it one direction. And that can go, usually goes to a pond or to a safe outlet somewhere in the landscape. But a lot of times diversion channels are used to fill ponds. PA Yeomans used a lot of diversion channels besides his key line plows in the landscape. So where he did have runoff, he could, he could then lead the water into ponds and then he used the water in the ponds to do what he calls flood flow irrigation, where he can take the, um, take the water into a swale and overflow it over the spillway over the whole length of the swale. It then runs across the key line field, sinking into the uh, rips as it goes. And so you can irrigate a field really rapidly and with very little manpower. It's one of the cheapest systems of irrigation in the world today. Okay, the next level, uh, broad-based terracing. Broad-based terraces were invented uh, in the modern era at any rate by the Soil Conservation Service in its early days, 1930s, 40s um, particularly. And they put these over vast areas of Midwestern uh, and, and other area farm fields in the United States. A broad-based terrace is like a swale in the landscape. It's on contour. It, tends, it holds water and infiltrates it. But it's designed to be so broad that you can actually cross it with farm equipment. You could drive tractors up and down, you know, over these broad-based terraces. And you hardly will see any of them in operation anymore. Almost all of them have been destroyed by large-scale agriculture over the years. They were sort of uh, inconvenient enough. They wanted big, giant fields. At any rate, so there's, there's still some broad-based terraces out there. Um, the next level up would be terracing. Uh, and terraces are used in pretty big amounts of the uh, farm landscapes in different countries. You see pictures of rice paddies in Bali, for instance, or in Japan, or in China, or in Nepal. And there's a lot of terraces built by the Incas and their predecessors in South America, which are still in use today, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of years later. So terraces can be quite stable in the landscape. They can also, if they're designed poorly, they can blow out and cause damage. So terracing has to be done very carefully. Indigenous traditional agriculturists were really good at it. They had hundreds of years to perfect their, their terracing. Some terraces are uh, back-sloped in that they slightly slope to the back of the terrace to help hold water. If it's rain-fed terraces and some parts of Nepal, they have to outslope them so that it can spill water. Because if you put, if you infiltrate too much water on a steep slope, you can cause, cause the whole slope to slough off, to big landslips, big landslides. So terracing has to be done really carefully, the hydraulics of it. You don't want to infiltrate too much water onto a slope that, that uh, can't handle it. Um, so look to our uh, indigenous uh, and traditional agriculturists for the best information on terracing. 
Uh, an example of modern terracing, uh, really well developed, is uh, uh, Austrian Sepp Holzer. He's a famous permaculturist in Austria. He builds big terraces. You can watch some of his YouTubes on, uh, on the internet where he's building these really large terraces with uh, large excavators, and it costs quite a bit of money. It's a lot of earth moving uh, to build these large-scale terraces. Of course, traditional agriculture is a huge amount of hand labor to build terraces. But these things have a long-term payback. If they're there for 100, 200, 500 years, that's a long time to sort of pay back that effort put into the terracing. So terracing can really... Uh, improve the water retention in the landscape. In Nepal, I was in Nepal uh, studying their, their terraces there, and they have very carefully designed the systems so that if the, ter the terraces are full of water and they need to still spill water, they have rock line channels, just ser really ser serious rock line channels to get that water off the landscape safely without eroding things. Uh, along these lines is, a, is also the system put in place by the Nabataeans in the Negev Desert. Oh, this is back oh, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, these people were living in a, this is a serious desert, the Sinai Desert, the Negev Desert, Israel and Egypt. And um, these people developed an irrigation system that really is rivaled the the Nepalese in terms of its complexity. They caught water runoff from rocky areas, from mountain areas, and they caught it. Uh, and they would where streams would come into their agricultural or landscapes, they would they would in a sense tame that water by directing it into these uh, big these fields which had rock walls around it. Once that field was filled, there was a spillway to fill the next field down slope and then another slope. And they also had canals so that they could, once the one field was full, they could then run it in a canal to another field and so forth and so forth. And they had these things so well designed that they were ready for a hundred year flood. If there was a hundred year flood event, they were able to take all that water and infiltrate it into their agricultural systems to take advantage of it. So there was no rainfall too big for them to handle and they do they had incredible uh, rock engineering to do these things and you can read about it in a book called the negev challenge of a desert by a israeli named michael evanari and he was an archaeologist who just recently and in, in recent times figured out this ancient nabataean irrigation system fantastic uh, ideas and of course, that's a lot of work, but they were able to support a whole civilization in the middle of a very uh, dire desert there by catching what rainfall did fall. So, any anyway, rate, so there's a whole range of techniques from very, from not very intensive to very, to very intensive systems. And if we use the appropriate scale, you don't want to overkill, you use what you need to stop the erosion and to hold the water in the landscape using the, these various methods. And in California today, they can have huge flood events, uh, water rushing off of the, off the hills, and it causes a lot of erosion, a lot of flooding. They could store that water in the landscape instead. They could, they could, they could stop their floods. They would infiltrate the water. They would have a lot more water in the landscape. There is a, there, when you infiltrate water into the landscape, you refill your aquifers. You'll get springs popping out where there hadn't been there for years or hundreds of years. You, dead springs will start to flow again. It evens out stream flow and river flow. There's, less flow in rainy periods, and there is more flow in dry periods. So all of these things can fix up our water hydrological cycles around the world, and they're damaged in many places. And I'm going to direct you to one particular inspiring example. Uh, this is in India. This just happened in recent years. Uh, I think their video was in 2010. It's called the Miracle Water Village. 
And it's a story about how a village area, through collective community participation, they didn't get big outside funding, they the local people banded together and put in a whole series of these swales and re diversion channels and contour buns, etc., to infiltrate the water that fell on their landscape. And they went from a drought-prone, poor quality agriculture to a thriving, very productive, productive agriculture. A lot of the people that had left the villages to go back to, to work in cities were able to come back to the villages. It was just a very inspiring story. Now, as a result of the Miracle Water Village's success, a lot of other villages in India have been doing the same thing. It's actually spreading all across India. In fact, they now have contests to see which village can put in the most water retention structures in one year. And they have serious contests. And I mean, these villages are going at it, folks, and they are creating water retention landscapes. And if they can do it in India on village participation, we can do this anywhere in the world. Um, and so study these systems, and uh, I hope that more and more people will jump into this earth repair. We have to restore the earth. And so thanks for listening to this uh, chapter. Bye for now and uh, take care of your landscape.